doing it. I realized later on, oh, when we were chit chat, I, I get a message saying meeting is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. Uh, it's a, just a second. I need to. Okay. It, it's not, we're not live. Oh, shit, we're live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we're live now. I thought I had to input things. I started it early. It wasn't Salim, it was me. Okay. Uh, well, we're not live now, are we? Can we stop it? I'm afraid that if I stop it. Because what happened the last time was that our chit chatting before the session was on caught on live uh, stream. There's John. Let me see. I paused it. Let me see if I, yeah, I know that. I know what you're saying. Hi, John. Hey. Gunja, you in Abu Dhabi? I'm in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> why didn't you tell us that, why didn't you tell us we should meet you there? <laughs> I mean, I we could have just... rearranged this. Karen and I have could have come to Abu Dhabi to do this. <laughs> well, I was just telling my partner that um, who's dean of uh, hum uh, arts and humanities at NYU here, that, um, you know, at some point we should join forces, Brooklyn, CUNY and NYU. And uh, absolutely, right? Abu Dhabi would have been the perfect place to have a session on African-American history and the world. Right. Well, I've just been, I, I've, I've been steeped in rereading my father's autobiography to get why he went to these places. Mm. And I was just reading before I changed um, that on the trip to Zanzibar in 64, mm -hmm. he got a call first the day Kennedy was assassinated from the White mm. House, asking mm. him to be part of this delegation to the independence in Zanzibar. Mm. And he was just too upset with the assassination. He said, can I call you later? And so, of course, the White House and State Department was all upset. And they called him 10 days later and said, please respond to our reply. The independent celebrations are in two days. Mm. So dad let them make the arrangements. And they were last minute because of the president's assassination. And they had to fly here, there, and yon to get to Zanzibar in the first place. Mm -hmm. And on the flight, the State Department person was pressuring my father to take an ambassador, ambassadorial appointment in Europe from the Johnson administration. Huh. This was two weeks into the Johnson administration. Mm -hmm. And my father said, no, my commitment is to scholarship and teaching. Mm. And he held fast and he said yeah. he wasn't taking any ambassadorships, deanships, university presidencies. Wow. And he was offered on various occasions other ambassadorships. And he said, no, my mm. commitment is to teaching. So I just finished reading that and I said, well, let me come downstairs and get ready for Philip and Bunja. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's really lovely. So we are, ah, Nishani is here. Um, I just... Let me let me uh, um, offer my apologies. I was following instructions and the instructions were incomplete. So we are actually live, although no one's going to link to us until two o'clock. That's OK. Who is the host? Well, uh, currently, all f I'm going to make all four of us co-hosts so that we can all share screen and do everything. But I'm technically the host. OK, great. So as long as you permit me to share a screen. Yeah. Dr. Frazier. Dr. Hi. Frazier. 
How are you? How are you? You're mute. So I'm a little tired, but I'm here. That's um, good. So glad that you're able to join us. Oh, uh, so enjoy. I, you have to excuse me. I'm going to try and adjust a little bit here. <laughs> Get lighting and all of that kind of stuff correct. So love the painting behind you. Yeah. Hey, Ty. Hey, Ty. Nice. Yeah, it's the image of Haiti. Haiti Center is a really well-known African-American center, um, historic uh, church, St. Joseph, which was established 1891. Mm, so, yeah. Mm, I think that's, yeah, I think, yeah, I didn't want that shiny part. <laughs> Gunja and Philip, Haiti is the name given to the Black community in Durham. Ah. Mm -hmm. to honor Haiti. Ah. Because in the 19th century, you could say Haiti to a white person and be just terrified because they think of <laughs> you're going to come kill, you know, the <laughs> Black people in revolt. So what a wonderful place to name your community so they have to say it. Haiti, Haiti, Haiti. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, I, I want to just introduce Napoli. I'm, I'm uh, uh, Professor Sengupta's colleague. I'm sitting in her chair as far as I'm concerned in the history department office. Um, and I'm technically the, the host here. Okay. Mm. And um, we've met virtually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm in but I've heard uh, incredible things about your work. And of course, John has been singing your praises as well. So we can't wait to hear you. Oh, well, um, now you make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and and read your book. That's uh, that's at the top of my reading list at this point. Yes, my labor of love. Working well, on she was a Fulbright scholar. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. That was great. I was in Norway. Which is wow. Really yeah, on the, uh, so, so what was what was the level of interest in African American history in Norway? Very high. Very, very, very high. They were interested in issues around police brutality. Um, at the time, of course, Donald Trump was running for president. So a lot of focus on him um, and, and what it could mean for the United States. A um, lot of focus on uh, the history of the civil rights movement. That was super popular. So those were the sort of the three biggest lectures. I had something called... Um, wild card where the students could just ask me anything about American history. Uh, but that actually was not as popular as the civil rights movement uh, classes and then the police brutality, history of police brutality classes. Those were mm -hmm. like at the very top. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Before you joined us, Nishani, I was saying that I've been rereading my father's autobiography, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for this talk. And he goes to Stockholm and Denmark so on several occasions. Yes. And yes. one of the ambassadorships he was offered was to be ambassador to Norway. What? Mm. You know, the thing of it is, is I've been going through his papers and I just realized, you know, Dr. Frank was just everywhere. And I can't keep up with the dates of where he is at a particular time. I'm like, wait a minute. Now, when is this? Is this 60s? Is this 70s? 80s? You know, so yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised at all, yeah. <laughs> quite frankly. The true citizen of the world is how some of us think of him, honestly. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if we could take a few minutes just to talk about, um, you know, the logistical stuff. Okay. Um, uh, toward the end, I'd like to try the PowerPoint that I have. Yes, exactly. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Should, should we do that now? I think it's not a bad idea. You guys both have the rights yeah. to share the screen, just please give it a shot. Go ahead, Nishani. Okay, so I want to see if uh, this will work with the presenter view. Uh, yeah. So I'd like yep. not not for you all to see the presenter part. <laughs> so I have to have my notes. So give me one second here. All right, so mm. Mm. Do you all see my notes or? Yes. 
Yes. I can see the Tutu and Franklin journey towards peace. All right, yes. but that's the only part that you can see. And then no, I see no. um, GWW and From Slavery to Freedom. Yes, okay. So just wanna make sure, cause there's the images and that's the only thing that I want you all to see. And then it's me kind of getting my sort of thoughts together. And that's on a separate part, which I don't want you to see. Well, I can see the text if that's, yeah, if that's I the question. Too. I can. Okay, yeah, that's what I was trying to avoid the visual of the text. That's what I would like to, to, to hide. And I don't know if there is a, I don't know. a way to do that. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just kind of do it the regular old way. Hopefully I'll remember everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm going to stop share now, I think. Okay. Um, okay. I have my text printed out. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I do it when I have to do those lectures. Yes, I tried to get it printed out, um, but it just was chaos. So I just. Uh, and I handwrite. So I am <laughs> the most Luddite of all among all of us. Can you see my images? Absolutely. Oh, yes. yes. Perfect. Is that a couple that? gorgeous? Are oh. they gorgeous? Dr. Franklin looks like he is stepping out. <laughs> Senior year in high in college. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's very isn't elegant. She, yes. Isn't she stunning? Oh, oh yes. Oh, gosh, yes. Oh wow. These are absolutely this is, this is 47. Wow. 47 or 48. They've moved to Washington. This is done by the Skirlock Studio, the famous African American. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, photographers in Washington. Oh, wow. Versailles, 1951. Yeah. You see them there? See mom yeah. and dad? Uh -huh. Yes, that's amazing. Wow. Karen and I have the same photo we took in 2018 wow. when I took two groups back to back of museum members to look at the African American experience in Paris. And I started in the 18th century and brought it all up to the present. Hmm. Look how young he is. This is 51. Oh, my. Wow. It's on the Queen Mary. OK, uh -huh. he said it's 51. All right. It's teaching in Salzburg. Yes. Yeah, yeah. First day in Calcutta, Gunja. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there you go, the palm trees. Look at the <laughs> oh. Queen He's Mary. September 5th, 1962. Wow. Huh. In Cambridge. Wow, that's a great image. Berlin. Huh. Cambridge. Mm. And then I flash back to the U.S. What's happening in 65 in the U.S.? This is the March of Selma to Montgomery. Right. Dad leading the group of U.S. historians. That's Arthur Mann in the middle and mm. Bill Luckenberg on the right. Oh, photo wow. taken by Dennis Hopper. Really? That's fabulous. Oh. You never seen my dad with a machete, have you? No, no. <laughs> I haven't. Collecting orchids in Costa Rica. And there's mom, of course, in a suit, hair done, sunglasses. <laughs> So you, this is when you have to, you travel, you have to look a certain kind of way. That's just the bottom line. <laughs> look at mom. She's too sharp. It's really. Joan Mondale, yeah. Joe Duffy, the head of the East, the Education Bureau of the State Department. Yes. Huh. Dad in China. In China. Belgrade with Amadou yeah. Maktan Bo, the in Secretary China. General of UNESCO, 1980. Teaching yeah. in Senegal. Wow. 81, hmm. meeting President Senghor. Huh. You see how I've grown in the background there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love your beard. <laughs> and, and Senghor said, and the young, since I'm no longer president, the young Franklin will interpret for us. Ooh, talk about PhD orals. Oh my God. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Berlin. Mm. with his Japanese 
uh, colleague in the in the gray tie, so it's a Honda. Mm-hmm. Dad went back and forth to to American studies programs in Japan, and that's Sozo's wife, children, and other graduate students studying in the United States. My mother in the pink, her sister in the striped dress. Ah. Mm. Back to the U.S. This is on Air Force One. Yep. That's the P.I.R. You see Bill? Yes. Yes, we do indeed. Chris Edley. Susan Johnson Thompson huh. with the um, Archbishop on yeah. Gore. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that at the end, yeah. So, uh, uh, Brazil, this is uh, Salvador de Bahia. Mm. And Cambridge, the last international trip, 2007. Mm. Uh, this is really spectacular. These this photos are really quite something. Yeah. Um, a lot of fun. Clarification, because I thought we were speaking about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Am I correct? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, about 20 minutes would be fine, 20, 25. Uh, so what I thought we would do is, you know, it's every year um, we like to give our students a little introduction explaining the significance of John Hope Franklin and his connection with Brooklyn College. Some of them know about him and then some don't. Um, and and then we sort of uh, launch into the program. So um, the way we usually do it, and we'll probably do it the same way, um, is I'll do a little introduction uh, and then introduce uh, the speakers, introduce both of you, perhaps successively that way there won't be any interruptions in the program. And perhaps John can go first and then you, Nishani, and um, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some time for questions from students. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. I'm going to begin with a quote from, two quotes from my father, one describing his experience writing Mm. from slavery to freedom, which which really launches him on the national stage. And that's the story that he takes abroad. And then he has a quote about his international travel. It's from his autobiography, but I'm, am I frozen? Mm-mm. No, I can hear you. Okay. We can uh, hear you and see you move. Okay. And he talks about the importance of traveling if he's allowed to say what he wants to say. Mm. He's not circumscribed by... Right our government or other people. Anyone else's, yeah. Right, hey, and uh, there's one instance um, when he's in Nigeria the first time, mm-hmm. and it's clear that the State Department has brought him there, even though Nelson Rockefeller is chair of an all white delegation. Right. Mm-hmm. They brought him there at the exact same time so that it will appear that the U.S. delegation is integrated. Dad makes a point, even though Nelson Rockefeller invites him to all the social and other gatherings to not mm. be there, to not be photographed with them. Mm. And that's clearly an example of when the State Department's trying to use him. Right. And uh, there are other I'm instances. I'm going to talk about that part now. I feel like I got to go with something else. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to briefly mention that because okay. uh, I read it. I'll read the quote. And then I'm, I'll just allude that he was, it was a lily white delegation. You can talk right. about the, the ramifications of that. Right. Um, but I thought we needed to hear his voice. Right. Oh, yeah. And I have a couple of props. Okay. My thanks are to my mother for writing the date, name, and who's in the picture on back on the back of these photos. Wow. <laughs> yes. that's, that's a librarian in uh-huh. an archivist yes yes and then when I was preparing this talk for the Fulbright board look what I found all of their passports <laughs> <laughs> and I've been through each page of them yesterday 
and my mom went to Iran. Mm. I knew dad had gone to Iran. I did not know my mother had gone to Iran till I saw it, the stamp in her passport. Wow, what year? Um, they're in Iran in, it's 65, no, she's with him later in the 70s, oh. 70, 73, 74. Hmm. He'd been all these places before the before the Six Day War, before the revolution in Iran. My father used to bring me candy from the Tehran Hilton. <laughs> and then my mother kept the tickets. Nashani, you too young to actually know that they were tickets before e-tickets. <laughs> the tickets in 74 throughout <laughs> Central and South America. <laughs> Chicago, Midway, to Miami, to Panama City, to San Jose, Costa Rica, Caracas, Santiago, Buenos Aires, Mendoza, Rio, Recife, Salvador, Rio de Janeiro, Brasilia, wow. Sao Paulo, Caracas, Miami, Chicago. That's quite a trip, isn't it? That's amazing. That's why I said every time when I was going through the archives, I could not keep up with all little places. <laughs> it was just like it was like uh, the, the there was a kid show called Carmen San Diego, and they said, <laughs> "Where in the world is Carmen San Diego?" <laughs> and I go through Doctor Frank and Franklin's papers. I'm like, "Where in the world is Doctor Franklin today?" <laughs> well, when he when he you know, in the last several years, I had to keep his calendar in my calendar so I'd know where he was. Mm. Hmm. You know, you know how much he traveled, Nashani? Yeah, I know. That's why I, 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 I remembered. But then to like see it written down, it, it actually took me back to when I was trying to organize his schedule and how insane it was trying to do his schedule was just, it was insane. <laughs> it was not, it was not easy. Dr. Franklin was always on the go. Yeah, yeah. You know, this would make a great book. Um, has anyone written about John Hope Franklin's engagement with the world? We have not yet, have we, Nishani? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the way thing. <laughs> that is going to be you. <laughs> so I'm working on my autobiography, but this is a that's a this is a separate book. Yeah, yeah. no, because yeah. I think that's one of the least talked about is the way in which Dr. Ah. Franklin is really uh, to you to your point about being an international citizen, but also the way he's representing Black Americans, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially in the context of the Cold War and the assumptions that people have about Black Americans. In a lot of ways, he's challenging, right, the presumptions and images of, people, of what people sort of think of when they think about Black people. So, yeah, it's... It's, it's important, but, but also in Afro-Asia, the civil rights movement uh, is a major source of inspiration for social yeah. justice, let's say, um, Dalit rights movements in India, uh, right. decolonization in uh, Africa and Asia. Um, so that's a really important, I mean, colonized peoples breaking the chains of colonialism are really looking to Black America right. for direction and inspiration. So I think that this is really an important part of his life story and his legacy. Uh, for for people who don't live in the U.S. Um, and Dr. Franklin talks about that, uh, that there was, when he did travel, there were so many questions from people of color, from Europeans about African-Americans and the civil rights movement, um, history of, of African-Americans in the United States. So, uh, and of course he didn't go there with the intention of speaking about that subject only, uh, but that would be, it was sort of like my experience in Norway. I had a whole litany of things that I thought I would talk about. Um, and what I ended up talking about most is the black experience in the United States. 
Uh, and to your point, I, you know, people are drawn, right, to, to the Black freedom movement, influenced by it, uh, that kind of thing. My parents said that uh, when they first went to Europe in 51, people would just follow them because they'd never seen anyone that looked like that, whether it was in France or Germany or Italy or in the UK. And when my father turned to the Germans and spoke to them in German, they just almost passed out because they just couldn't, they didn't know who this was. And do you speak our language too? I mean, it was just amazing. Now yeah. I've been in circumstances in rural, what was then Yugoslavia, and had children follow mm -hmm. me because they'd never seen anybody look like me before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These were barely, they barely had electricity. And I was in this village on the mm -hmm. border with Albania when the Americans landed mm -hmm. on the moon in 69. Wow. And there was a white American girl in my French camping room. And we were both there to mm -hmm. improve our French in Yugoslavia of all places. And <laughs> And <laughs> by any means necessary, do that French. And they heard that there were Americans and they came, we were staying in a schoolhouse, sleeping on the floor in our sleeping bags. And they roasted a lamb for us. Mm. And they heard that there were Americans and they wanted to come and congratulate the Americans for landing on the moon. And I kept the newspaper for years of the color photograph mm. in Serber Croatian of the Americans mm. landing on. So mm. you never know what's yeah. going to happen while you're away and what you're going to have to react to. Uh, when I was mm. in France at 14, we were watching, mm. I was living with a French family and we were watching the evening news and the riots in the States in 67 were on the news. And I had to explain to my French family the whole history of race relations and that helped me become fluent because I knew the subject matter and I had to figure out how to say it in French. So uh, dad speaks of many times that he was in England with the civil rights mm -hmm. movement and people were just fascinated. We were there as they were preparing for the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. and dad spoke to a program mm -hmm. called Panorama uh, and it was the Britain's mm -hmm. Guide to the March on Washington. And oh, we were actually wow. on the Queen Elizabeth in the days prior to the march. And we arrived in New York on the 27th of August and watched the march the 28th from our living room in New York. Uh, so it's fascinating watching the United States, knowing that the rest of the world also is watching the United States from afar. Gunja, how long are you in Abu Dhabi? Um, that's a really good question uh, in the age of, um, I'm adequate for the rest of the year and uh, scrambling to meet all these deadlines with the press, you know, with the current book goes into production and so on. After that, we're supposed to go to um, Lagos, actually, Nigeria. Um, in in a couple of weeks, we'll be there for a, for a year, a, a, for a week. It is about 11.30, well, no, 11 o'clock, almost 11 o'clock at night uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so, so I didn't really mean a year in Nigeria, a week. Um, and then we were thinking of going to Zanzibar, um, which we write about uh, in the book, but um, I haven't really explored the place at all. And this is one of the ironies when, uh, you know, when the archives are available online or uh, in the British Library or the archives of India, um, you end up uh, not having to go to some of the places that you're writing about. So I feel like Gunja, can I ask a favor? Please turn off your video for now. Her Wi-Fi signal is clearly un unstable. And can, can you? Uh -huh. That's going to be better. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, better. Karen and I went to Zanzibar as part of a conference of the African Diaspora Heritage Trail uh, mm -hmm. in 2015. Mm -hmm. And mm. when, Karen, when was it, Karen? 2009, sorry, 2009. And the conference began, um, it was opened by the president of Tanzania. You know, Tanzania has two presidents, President Tanzania in Dar. And then we took the presidential boat, which was lovely, to Zanzibar. And the conference was opened by the president of Zanzibar. And then we said, we're coming all this way for one day? I don't think so. So we stayed for four or five days. And we stayed at the hotel on the far side of the island, not where all the slave trail uh, monuments, the slave prisons are, but it's, uh, I'll think of the name of the hotel. There are two, there's one in Dar and one in, um, in Zanzibar. And it's right on the Indian Ocean and you have to swim in the Indian Ocean there. The water is so warm, it's so fabulous. Uh, so Gunja, make sure that you have some pleasure time in addition to research time. <laughs> yes, that is the plan. Although in the pandemic, you know, we propose and uh, who knows, viruses dispose. So, um, uh, so, so no, we we certainly hope to. Uh, get a little playtime in as well. Um, you can see you can see the fishermen at low tide going out to uh, to catch octopus octopi. Mm -hmm. mm. Huh. So. So I'm I'm just curious. Is everyone else's Wi-Fi fine? Is is it just because the rest of you are uh, freezing periodically? I I'm hoping that it's just my problem at this point. I'm afraid I think it is. I, I'm hardwired, um, and so mm -hmm. I don't have a Wi-Fi issue. Okay. Yeah, I should repeat, we are currently streaming. We're going to wait another 10 minutes or so, maybe a little less, and then let folks in um, and begin the program right on time at, at 2.15. There is only one person streaming on, on YouTube, me. <laughs> I happen to know that. Uh, but there will be at least 70 folks from two classrooms joining us on, on, um, uh, on YouTube. Yeah. 90 okay. plus people. Um, registered for the event. We have lots of our friends who registered. Fabulous. Fantastic. So glad. We said uh, on the other hand, I tell myself I wouldn't have been able yeah, she's that's why they put her on. Huh? Wi Fi is you know, she had her turn off her camera. You see how many hotels are in Zanzibar now? Good. That's true. Right, Kapinski, that was it. No.
I was just looking up hotels in Zanzibar. There are lots of them now. We we should we should go back there. Philip, don't you think we should meet? I there would now? love that. <laughs> I would adore the idea. I would love to travel with the four of you guys. I mean, it would be just amazing. <laughs> better than a better than a graduate seminar. Yeah. We'll let people in about two ten. That's good. Okay. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Nishani, I know you see the orchid behind me, right? It's beautiful. It's These so are all from the grocery store. I've grown them several years. And this oh, one wow. is just showing out today. I tried to grow orchids and I did a good job for a long time. And then after a while, it just <laughs> so it killed over. And I remember thinking Dr. Frager would be good and mad with me. <laughs> Important thing is not to let them drown. Don't ever let them sit in water. Yeah, well, I try not to do that, but I realize I have a problem with overwatering. I'm an overwaterer. <laughs> okay. This plant behind me, once a week, once a week, no more. Yeah, no, I was, I would do the whole, <laughs> just pour water. Yeah, I've gotten much better in my sort of plant abilities. I'm not as sort of over loving. Let's, let's put it like that. <laughs> Remember, orchids sit on trees. When it rains, the water drains off immediately. Yes, I know. They can what? never sit in water ever. They drown. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. I learned it the hard way. Because all the ones that come in grocery pots, grocery stores are in pots that don't have a hole in the bottom. So you have to take so you have to take them out of that in the little plastic pot, sit them in the sink, water them, let the water drain, and then put them back in that pot with huh. no hole. See, I would I would have to say that I I, I realized I was overwatering it, over loving it, as I like to say. <laughs> Cause um, you know, it, I finally realized a little bit too late because it was starting to get that super, super damp thing around the, the roots and stuff that let me know that I had overloved it. <laughs> so, but since I have that tendency with plants in general, I've gotten much better. But good, good, you know, good. there is hope care. for them. Yes, but you know, taking care of plants, especially, you know, with my schedule, I just had to let it go. I'm writing down my notes since I, I can't read from. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, let me write this down. Then. Philip, I've turned off my phone. So if you need to contact me, just put it in the chat or something. Understood. Thank you. I didn't want it ringing. And the same thing with my email. I turned that off, turn off the sound on everything. So, are you having in person classes? We are back to in person classes, and we're thrilled um, to, to be back in, the, in a classroom with students. It was painful to teach the black boxes I and mean, little squares on a screen are it's just not the same. Um, it's so it's lovely. And, and all of the other things that go along with a college education, talking to students in the hallway, running into colleagues, it's terrific. I'm uh, glad. And the whole question of the mask mandate and when that might go away is uh, one That's of the things.
we didn't hear you. Philip, are both you and Gunter going to speak? Can you guys hear me? Now yes, we can. you can. Mm -hmm. uh, you you can. Um, I'm I'm panicking slightly. <laughs> I hope that um, Phil. Um, if uh, I if my voice right. th disappears, will you be able to pick up the threads of production? Right. <laughs> I will do my <laughs> utmost and, and very best. We nobody replaces you. That's a that fact. Doesn't, let's hope that doesn't happen. I'll I'll mute myself now. Right. But I do believe we should begin to let folks in. So I'm going to admit everybody to the wait room. We are streaming and uh, yeah, George. <laughs> Hey, Rob. Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm very well. Great to see you. Good to be seen. Good to see you. <laughs> Miani, John. Are, are you hi, in New York? Hi. Nice to see you. Great to see you, too. No, I'm right here in Silver Spring. Okay. All right. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It is. <laughs> hey, Karen. Hi. <laughs> Glad to see you. Uh, hi, nice Karen. to see you too. Hey, Rob. How are you? Fine. If we keep meeting like this, people will talk. They will. George, James, I see you all. Uh, Betty, Triopia's on. Barbara Dunn. Oh, Hi, John. Hi. How are you? Good morning, John. Good morning, John. Yeah. Good morning, all. Cynthia, Frankie Perry, <laughs> Andy. Hello. How lovely. John, just to let you know, I just had a wonderful conversation with Ken Quinn, and I'll get I'll send you an email. Thank you so much. Triopia. Yeah, nice. Uh, hello, John. Hi, Triopia. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure.
Rob. Look at John. Hello, hello. Hi, Karen. <laughs> And just crying and saying, I'm on my you please reveal yourself and I'm, my mic is muted. I'm good. No, it's not, Karen. It was in one of those prayers in my bedroom that I audibly heard the voice of Christ. And he said, Hey, uh, it's me. Oh, <laughs> Philip, you're on mute. You think I'd learn. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce myself and get the program started. My name is Philip Napoli. I am the, the chair right now of the Brooklyn College Department of History. I am thrilled in, uh, to have all of you with us. Um, the audience is still assembling, uh, so I'll be clicking buttons here. Um, <laughs> this afternoon, we have the... Uh, the privilege of, of uh, listening to my colleague, uh, Gunja Sengupta, the former chair of the history department, John Franklin and uh, Professor Nishani um, uh, Frazier. Um, and I just wanna tell you a little bit about um, operating procedures here. We are recording. Um, so if you don't wish to have your face recorded or voice heard, please turn off your camera and mute yourself. If you don't mind, that's leave it on, uh, your camera on. Otherwise, please do mute yourself. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the, uh, of the session. Um, I am, uh, I guess that's it, right? Uh, that's the way to start. Um, I will turn the floor over to Professor Sengupta. Hello, Steve. I think I'm going to ask Professor Zingupta to turn off her camera. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'll start again. Hearty welcome, everyone, to Brooklyn. Colleges John Hope Franklin Day. I welcome our students, our audience members, and of course our distinguished speakers about whom more in a moment. Um, Nishani Fraser, John W. Franklin, Karen Franklin, and other Franklin friends and family who are watching, who have joined us. Um, I want to start by thanking our benefactors, uh, the historian historian Kimberly Phillips Bowen endowed this event and the History Department's Lions Fund um, and to our co-sponsors, the Wolf Institute for the Humanities, the Afghan Studies Department and the American Studies Program. And as I do every year, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to explain to our students who John Hope Franklin was. Um, and his connection with Brooklyn College. Um, uh, John Hope Franklin, after whom the event of, is of course named. Um, this is a timely moment to commemorate and celebrate life and work of a historian who made a world of difference. In a work on in history entitled Slavery from Slavery to Freedom, published in changed our perspective on U.S. history. The place 
center of my understanding of all American. Franklin grew up in the New York Times editorial writer Brent Staples. Our job is both African American and Native American. It was bombed without hearing. He drove through two states without hearing the news. And why? Because they could not stop at restrooms or restaurants that carried white. Work showed to understand how structures of oppression developed historically, made by men, not nature, then you have a powerful tool in historical knowledge to dismiss structures of oppression. And this vision of an activist history tied his scholarship with the civil rights uh, movement. He helped submit legal briefs about the 14th Amendment in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, which of course dismantled or sought to dismantle segregation in the public schools. And the civil rights movement, as we know, reverberated around the world, right? Um, inspired colonization movements in Afro-Asia, um, social justice movements uh, in places like India among Dalits, and very importantly, it made it possible for immigrants of color, such as myself, right? An Asian American such as myself, to not just come to this country, but to become citizens. And so African American history, activism, made the world a better place for all of us. Um, I just want to uh, end before I introduce the speakers, and by noting that Franklin had a special connection with Brooklyn College. He became chair of the history department here in the 1950s. Um, and he was the first African-American scholar to hold such a position at what was considered a predominant white institution. And this was so unusual that the New York Times memorialized this event on its front page. And so, with this, I'd like to turn the stage over to our distinguished speakers. We are so delighted to have them here. Um, John Whitten Franklin, by and hopefully have the uh, John Whittington Franklin is managing member of Franklin Bowl LLC and senior manager emeritus of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African-American history and culture. He has co-edited with his father, John Hope Franklin, My Life and an Era, the autobiography of Buck Colbert Franklin. Um, he will be followed by Nishani Fraser, who is an associate professor of American studies and history at the University of Kansas. Franklin, while he was chairing President Clinton's advisory board on One America. She's the author of Harambee City, The Congress of Racial Equality in Cleveland, Ohio, and The Rise of Black Power Populism, which was published by uh, the University of Arkansas Press in 2017. Welcome, John and Nishani. The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Gunja. Gunja is in Abu Dhabi and we're having connectivity challenges as you may have heard. So we're glad you can join us from afar. I'd like to thank Brooklyn College for honoring my father. And I'd like to thank professors Sengupta and Napoli, former and current chairs of the Department of History. Presentation today is possible due to my mother's writing the name and date and location on the back of all of the photos that I'm showing. She was a librarian and a documentalist and archivist. She also put away all of my parents' passports 
and I've gone through every page and can document where they were, when they were. I did not know until yesterday she had gone to Iran, but it's in her passport. And then Mirror to America, my father's autobiography, which I recommend to all of you, because I wanted to see why he went to these places. Now, my father's publications and presentations at the American Historical Association and the Southern Historical Association and the publication of From Slavery to Freedom in 1947 really brought him national attention. He wrote about that book and the experience about writing that book. In writing my work, I had witnessed more than 500 years of human history pass before my eyes. I had seen one slave ship after another from Portugal, Spain, France, Holland, England, and the United States pile black human cargo into its bowels as it would coal or even gold had either been more available and profitable at the time. I had seen them dump my ancestors at New World ports as they would load as they would a load of cattle and wait smugly for their pay and capture and transport. I had seen them black beat men, beat black men until they themselves became wary and rape black women until the ecstasy was spent, leaving them brutish, leaving their brutish savagery exposed. I heard them shout, give us liberty or give us death and not mean one word of it. I had seen them measure out medication or education for a sick or ignorant white child and ignore a black child similarly situated. I had seen them lynch black men and distribute their ears, fingers, and other parts as ghoulish souvenirs. I had seen it all. And in seeing it, I had become bewildered and yet in the process lost my own innocence. He first traveled outside of Oklahoma to Nashville for undergraduate, Harvard for graduate school, but his first sort of exotic experience was going to Baton Rouge in 1945 and with my mother to New Orleans. When they moved to Washington from North Carolina in 1951, my mother pursued a second degree in library sciences and a master's in library sciences from Catholic University and decided to make the grand tour to England, Italy, France, and my father taught at the Salzburg Seminar in Austria. Here they are. Here they are as fresh as senior sweethearts in at Fisk. And they moved to Washington in 47. This is a Scurlock photo. Here they are on the right in Versailles in 1951. May be surprising for young people, but we didn't fly back and forth to Europe at the time. We took ships. And this is on the Queen Mary. It's five days between New York and Europe. My father taught at the Salzburg Seminar. There are various places where American studies in post-World War II were focused. Austria, Germany, the United Kingdom, India, and Japan. So there'll be repeated trips there. My father taught at Wisconsin the, summer of, the spring of 53 and at Cornell the summer of 53. Post Brown of Board of Education, he went to England in July and August of 54 for a conference on American studies, ethnic regional influences at the US in the US in Peterhouse, Cambridge. In 55, he's invited to attend a conference in Braunschweig, Germany on the writing of textbooks in a post-Nazi Germany. Then to Rome to the meeting of the International Conference of Historical Societies and he spoke on sectionalism and the American history. In 1956, those Brooklyn College European history professors sitting in the front row of his presentation in Rome were Francis Childs, Madeline Robinson, and Jesse Clarkson, who was specialist in French, British, and Russian history. They saw him in Rome. They were sitting in the front row. 
Then the American Historical Association met in Washington that same year, and they asked, they came up to my father, complimented on his presentation, and asked if it was true that there was a rumor he had a party at his home. So they invited, they asked if they could come. This is during segregation now. And so the people from Brooklyn College came to my parents' home, and shortly thereafter, my father received the invitation to join the faculty at Brooklyn College. When he um, became a member of the American Council of Learned Societies, he was invited to represent the organization in India in 1957. This is of my father in Calcutta, where he went for the centennial anniversaries of the universities of Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. I know these names have changed since then. The Militant South was published in 1957, and we spent the summer at UC Berkeley, summer of 59 at the University of Hawaii. In 1960, my father was invited to speak at all of the universities on Australia, and he traveled around the world following that to Fiji, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Cairo, Rome, Copenhagen, and Stockholm. In 1960, he was invited to give a lecture in Ibadan and Ife, Nigeria's oldest universities, at the exact same time as Nigeria's independence. In 1962, John F. Kennedy appointed him to a three-year term to the Board of Foreign Scholarships, which we know as the Fulbright Board. And here we are, September 5th, 1962, headed for England on the Queen Mary, where my father would be the Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions at Cambridge, and he also lectured at the universities of Kiel, Manchester, Birmingham, London, Oxford, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Sussex, and Southampton. We spent Christmas in Morocco, New Year's in Paris, Easter in Italy. It's my first trip abroad. Back in New York, he's appointed in December 63 as special representative of the President of the United States with the rank of ambassador to Kenya and Zanzibar where he attends the independent celebrations in Zanzibar and he meets Prince Philip. He's also special representative to the President of the United States to Egypt and India in April and March of 1964. In 1964, this is in Germany, Cambridge. To keep you in, in the context of the United States, what people in the, abroad are watching of the United States, they're watching the civil rights movement. And wherever my father goes, they're asking him questions about what is happening at home. Why, is, why, why are African-Americans demonstrating? And so in 1964, after Bloody Sunday, my father invites his fellow historians to Selma, to march from Selma to Montgomery. And this is their hand-painted sign of US historians, his dad on the left, Arthur Mann in the middle, Bill Luchtenberg with the flag. Bill Luchtenberg's 99, he's still alive, it's amazing. Um, my father's love of orchids began in 1959 in Hawaii. And uh, here he is with a machete. I've never seen my father with a machete, but I thought I should share this image with you, collecting orchids in Costa Rica. He's traveling through Central and South America lecturing, but he has an agricultural permit to import orchids and when he gets the opportunity in Zanzibar, in South Africa, in Central America, in Brazil, he's collecting those orchids as much as he can. 1964, he moved to the University of Chicago and uh, my father has a diplomatic passport. He's working for the Fulbright Board and he lectures in Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Spain, France, India, Sri Lanka, Yugoslavia, and Denmark. Significant that he goes to many of these places before the Six Day War when American relations with the Middle East changed significantly. In September of 67, here he is collecting orchids again. In September of 67, after my summer living in France with a French family, prime minister and former colleague of my father's, at Howard University, Eric Williams, Prime Minister of Trinidad, invites dad to give a series of lectures at the public library in Port of Spain. And from there we go from Trinidad to Barbados and Jamaica, always collecting orchids. 
when he's now member of the Fulbright Board, he is inspecting universities and lecturing first in Central and South America in the 70s. And he goes to Costa Rica, Venezuela, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Panama, and then to Asia, to Singapore, Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand. He goes to the Soviet Union, Iran, Finland, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Greece. Here you see him talking with Joan Mondale, Vice President Mondale's wife, and Joe Duffy on the left, who is the US Secretary, Assistant Secretary of State for Education and Cultural Affairs. So on the Fulbright board, he's responsible for looking at the exchange of US scholars going abroad and foreign scholars coming to the United States. Here he is in China in 1979, in Belgrade at the UNESCO General Conference with uh, Secretary General Amadou Mokhtar Mbo. And in the 70s, he's still with the Fulbright board and traveling to India and Japan frequently, to Hong Kong. And I'm living in Senegal at that time from 74 to 82. And he comes to visit me with my mother for the first time in Senegal and invites me to go with him to Liberia, Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, then Zaire, back to the Congo now, Nigeria and the Ivory Coast. By this time from slavery to freedom has been translated into German, Japanese, Chinese, French and Portuguese, not in Spanish still now, not ever in Spanish, which is a great travesty. Here he is again in 1980 as a member of the delegation to the General Conference of UNESCO in Belgrade that's the United Nation Educational Science and Cultural Organization. He returns to Senegal in 1981 and 1983. Uh, when the From Slavery to Freedom is published, here he is at the University of Sheikh Anta Job, the University of Dakar. And there he is being introduced to the former president, uh, Seg Senghor of Senegal. They had met earlier when he had been president. And there I am standing in the background. Here we are in the audience with the former president, my, my, my mother on the right, and President Sanglor said, because I'm no longer head of state, I don't have the opportunity to practice French and the young Franklin will be my interpreter. Talk about difficult task. Here's dad lecturing in Germany um, or the Ernest Frankel Lecture with Willie Paul, April 25th, 1990. He has a, a generations of scholars in Japan. Dad to dad's left is Sozo Honda, who was a professor of African-American history in Japan and his graduate students. So my father refers to his students and his grand students. So these are grand students. My mother's in the pink, Sosa Honda's wife is in the green dress, and my mother's sister is second from the left in the white and gray striped dress. Back to the US, here's dad sharing President, President Clinton's initiative on race. They're on Air Force One. And you see dad is telling it. In 1990, uh, 1998, um, we film Tutu and Franklin, A Journey Towards Peace. By this time, dad has chaired President Clinton's initiative and the archbishop has chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Ceremony, uh, Commission. We're on the island of Gore. We had two fabulous weeks together. And uh, thanks to executive producer Camille Cosby, we were able to bring 21 young people, seven from South Africa, seven from the States and hosted by seven from Senegal. And it appears, as I said, documentary, Tutu and Franklin, A Journey Towards Peace. This is in 98. Prior to that, my parents have returned to Brazil for the centennial of Brazil's emancipation in 18, 1988 and for the public and for their 50th wedding anniversary in 1990. They said, oh, we have to go back to Brazil for our anniversary. Uh, his collection of 50 essays, uh, Essays Over 50 Years Race and History is published in Portuguese and he returns to Brazil in 99. My wife Karen and I have the opportunity to travel with him for the first time in Brazil 
Uh, and here he is lecturing in Salvador de Bahia. His final trip, uh, he won a, a, a gift of round trip, first class tickets anywhere in the world. And he chose to return to London. And this is his college in Cambridge, St. John's. And I think I've used up my time. So this is uh, my favorite last picture of my parents. It started, it started with them as senior sweethearts. Here they are in their 70s. And my father's two favorite things are catching trout and releasing them on the Madison River in Montana and with his orchids in his greenhouse in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for sharing those images and, and memories with us. Um, I, I particularly love the pictures. Um, uh, I would like to turn the floor over to our, our next guest, Professor uh, Fraser from the University of Kansas. Yeah. First, I have to steal that picture of Dr. Franklin with the orchids. <laughs> I just love that. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. So of course, I want to thank Brooklyn College for inviting me to talk on John Hope Franklin Day. Uh, I'm so happy and so honored to have this uh, invitation. One of the things that was interesting about working with Dr. Franklin uh, during the time that he was president's initiative on race and, and prior to that <clears throat> was that Dr. Franklin, uh, although quote retired and I'm putting heavy quotes around retired <laughs> was constantly a man on the go um, and initially I came to join Dr. Franklin to help with his archives as it was getting ready to be transitioned over at to Duke University and as I'm going through the archives again I am bowled over by the amount of international travel and listening to John Franklin talk about and naming the country is just it's almost overwhelming thinking about all of the uh, spaces and places that Dr. Franklin is sharing uh, the history of the Black experience. Um, I, I guess, Carol, you have a, a, a question? Are we, can we hold questions until the end? I think it's very much up to you, uh, Professor Fraser, if whatever you would like to do. Well, Carol, if you, if you have a question- I Maybe you could drop it in the chat. Yeah, that would be great. Um, as, as John Franklin has talked about Dr. Franklin's international experience, what I'd like to do is bring it in a little bit uh, and talk about Dr. Franklin uh, with regard to the African experience uh, and talk about it from two perspectives, one having to do with um, sort of the intellectual um, um, appeal of Africa as he is doing his work with From Slavery to Freedom, um, but then also thinking about it as a political space. I'm gonna share screen now and just, all right. So one of the things that I think is important to sort of talk about is that when Dr. Franklin starts to write from slavery to freedom, it's in a broader uh, context of other scholars, other historians doing work on African-Americans in the United States and uh, African history. But from slavery to freedom is absolutely distinctive. Uh, and in part, uh, uh, Dr. Franklin talks about coming upon the work of George Washington Williams, and in a sense, uh, taking that Harvard education, but also a cue from George Washington Williams and the way he went about talking about the Black experience. What's unique is that George Washington Williamson, uh, Williams breaks away from the way in which scholars of the 19th century talked about African-Americans. There was a tendency to construct history as a history of greats right? Uh, great Negro leaders, great Negro uh, inventors. There was not this broader social history that we're going to see coming about first with people like Carter G. Woodson, W.B. Du Bois, and then of course with Dr. Franklin. But Carter, um, I'm sorry, uh, George Washington Williams breaks away from that. Uh, and interesting enough, he breaks away in part in terms of reconstructing the notion that African people don't have a history, right? And this is also what's so important about From Slavery to Freedom. 
that African people are primitive, that they don't have a civilization, they don't have an empire. So George Washington Williams is among the first to sort of push away these notions of primitism, uh, prim, uh, primitive, pr pr <laughs> primitism, I think I'm saying this correctly, um, and to, to talk about Black people right, um, as a part of the broader human family. And this is really important because this is a period in which uh, people of African race are in the sort of uh, human hierarchy where uh, the European race is of the highest level and then um, African and Asian peoples are at the bottom. And interesting enough, in Dr. Franklin's archives, there's still this conversation about the influence of African civilization uh, on Western uh, ideals, uh, Western civilization. And so you can see this uh, piece from actually the 1990s. Uh, and it's also interesting because when Afrocentrism comes about in the 1980s, Dr. Franklin is, is really clear. He wants to avoid hagiography. But from the jump, he says, Africa, <laughs> it's already well known that African influence uh, Western civilization. Um, and so, and he talks about that also, obviously, in the context of from slavery to freedom. What's so beautiful about From Slavery to Freedom is in part, and you can see these really wonderful um, um, quotes coming where uh, people are sort of reviewing Dr. Franklin's first edition of From Slavery uh, to Freedom and talking about that uh, the ways in which Dr. Franklin starts with an understanding of the Black American experience by looking at the African experience, by looking at who we are before we are an enslaved people. So even though it's from slavery to freedom, Dr. Franklin is very clear in establishing that we are we come in as free persons, right? This is a process, historical process in which we are enslaved. And that previous to that, we are the people with culture. We are a people um, with a history. And you see Dr. Franklin sort of do a combination of sort of anthropological historical study. Now From Slavery to Freedom is designed to be a synthesis. What stands out about From Slavery to Freedom is the way he takes all of this new scholarship, you know, particularly uh, after 1900 with Carter G. Woodson and the advent of uh, Rayford Logan, other historians and scholars, and puts it into sort of beautiful um, sort of summary right, of the Black experience. And he presents Black people, right, as who we are. This is one of the things that um, really interesting. Charles Johnson talks about the way in which Dr. Franklin asserts the, 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 the relevance of Black history without having to respond to or compare it to European history. So it's not a function of if they're Black, white leaders, they're Black leaders, right? This is the presentation of the Black experience in the fullness of self, of ourselves, of our own history. Um, and you see this uh, play out in From Slavery to Freedom, uh, but you also begin to see this in terms of Dr. Franklin's own experiences. This is actually postcards that he has from his, his travels uh, during the 1960s to places like Zanzibar, and actually 1960s through 1970s, places like uh, Zanzibar, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and, and of course, uh, John Franklin uh, can actually probably list more countries than I can, right, uh, um, in terms of, uh, of sites of, of visit. So you get this combination of from, of from slavery to freedom where our culture, right, is given the standing it deserves as a site of um, historical study and historical understanding. But Dr. Franklin also has uh, a sense of Africa as a politicized space as well. And John Franklin has already referenced, for example, his going to Nigeria uh, in 1960. He is invited by the uh, State Department to look at this whole question of education in Nigeria. And it falls at the same time that uh, Nigeria is celebrating its independence and uh, a delegation of Americans have been sent in with this uh, uh, to, to 
to uh, uh, join and at least try to connect, right, with Nigeria. This, of course, is also uh, in the context of the Cold War. So uh, the United States wants to make it clear that they are supportive of independence. <laughs> uh, but interestingly enough, as John Franklin has already pointed out, it's an all white delegate. Uh, and Dr. Franklin is deeply uncomfortable uh, when uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, and John Franklin, you can correct me. It is Nelson uh, Rockefeller, correct? Right, okay. Um, invites him to join the delegation. Um, and as John Franklin was discussing before we uh, uh, had our, our session, our, our conference here, that uh, Dr. Franklin steadfastly avoided <laughs> joining and dealing with that delegation because it was clear that there was a level of usury going on and that he did not want to be a part of this kind of misrepresentation. Remember, this is 1960. African Americans do not have the right to vote, although the 15th Amendment grants it. Uh, all these states are uh, uh, passed all of these laws that uh, lead to disenfranchisement. Uh, there's still Jim Crow laws. And so it's deeply problematic, right, for uh, Dr. Franklin to join this party as if, um, you know, uh, there's not a problem within the context of the United States around this whole question of race. What's interesting is Dr. Franklin is not only clear about and supportive of decolonization, but he talks about the ways in which this process is also changing his own writing. And so there's a transition in from slavery to freedom over time that's reflecting of this, um, not just support, but the transformation that is taking place in Africa. And I should also point out that his interest in African politics goes all the way through the 1970s. Um, of course, one of the more uh, unique and interesting aspects, as, Dr., uh, as, as John Franklin has pointed out, is that Dr. Franklin is part of Fulbright. Uh, but the problem with Fulbright is that they have difficulty um, in this process of, of being full support, fully supportive of the exchange of scholars from locations like Asia, Latin America, and, and Africa. So Dr. Franklin has to be really assertive about pushing Fulbright to recognize uh, and break away from the assumptions, right, that people continue to have about Black intellectual ability. Um, you see this obviously also in the context of African Americans, where there's always this underlying question about whether someone is a legitimate scholar or good enough. And so from the inside, uh, uh, with the Fulbright, Dr. Franklin is also working to challenge these assumptions and open it up for scholars, um, and then open up the, these other spaces, Asia, Africa, for American scholars to visit. Um, and Africa is, I will say, into the uh, period of the 1980s, obviously, um, you know, Dr. Franklin is supportive of the anti-apartheid movement, but I think what's most interesting is um, that Tutu and Franklin and Journey Towards Peace, which John Franklin has already talked about. Um, what's interesting is that Dr. Franklin actually does the documentary at the completion of the um, report for the President's Initiative on Race. So this is very unique and interesting moment where the, the, the advisory board has been struggling with this whole question of how can the United States grapple with the problem of oppression and discrimination? And then at the same time, Bishop Tutu has just completed the Truth and Reconciliation uh, um, and report as well. And so the two come together uh, in this moment after both of these sort of challenges have been met by the two of them to talk about this whole question of what is the way forward, right? In terms of challenging racism, what is the way forward? And are there ways that uh, Black Americans and South Africans can connect, can, and can borrow from each other and move forward? So I wanna play a little bit of a clip if we have uh, time, I'm, I'm gonna check the time, just a little bit of a clip. Um, to uh, show 
uh, Dr. Franklin at Gore Island um, and a little piece of the documentary, because I think it sort of brings it all home together, the way in which Gore Island is both a site, a major site uh, for Black Americans historically, and at the same time, a space of having to grapple with this whole question of how do we uh, move forward to attain our freedom. And, and I think it's a beautiful moment. So I'm gonna play it just a little bit of it uh, and then open up uh, uh, the, uh, the stage for uh, uh, question and answer. The slave house cells are still there. Some for children, some for women, the worst men. Most were pinned for months, their bodies branded with the marks of their owners. Those who rebelled were punished. Eventually, all of them were said to pass through the so-called door of no return, the door to a ship that would take them to a lifetime of slavery. We pray for those who are here, and for those who caused them to be here, for the anguish and the pain and the suffering. We need to do all we can to help our children appropriate their history, appropriate the memory. We ought to be saying, this is where they tried to put us. Yes, and we've gone through that particular experience, but we survived. We are survivors. We're not victims. Every child, every adolescent, every man and woman should be fully acquainted with what happened in this house, the slave house. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. One of the problems uh, in the United States today is the refusal on the part of our young people yes. to, to remember yes. or to want to remember or to recognize uh, the experiences of the past as being relevant. So just looking at- I just want to stop right there. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Nishani. That was really powerful. Whew. So nice to hear his voice. Um, yeah, I get teary eyed when I see that. I show that documentary a lot, and it's just it's a combination of both seeing Dr. Franklin and, of course, since the passing of Desmond Tutu, uh, to see our elders in that way, and then in Gore Island, uh, which is its own space. It's it's, um, it's 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 a difficult documentary and beautiful at the same time. I would like to open the floor for questions. If you engage with our speakers, um, you may drop your question into the chat. I'm going to monitor the chat. Um, but it's also possible to unmute yourself and, and directly ask if you would like to. I'll try to, to uh, manage uh, the questions in that way also. Good afternoon, Professor Frazier. Um, my name is Say Connie. I'm a student at Brooklyn College. I was wondering if it's possible to show the slide from the newspaper clipping with President Nkrumah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a quote that's faintly at the bottom that I wanna 
that I, a quote that I want to capture. Thank you. Um, if you have an opportunity, just contact me by email and I'll show you, I'll send you the whole uh, front page. Uh, because when I saw that, I was like, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, and again, it, it, it said a lot about the way in which intellectually, uh, not just politically, uh, 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 not just historically, but intellectually and politically, Dr. Franklin is engaged in this uh, nationalist, African nationalist movement. Professor Fraser, for the benefit of those um, who may not be able, would you mind reading the quotation to us? Sure. Um, I felt immediately at home in Harlem and sometimes found it difficult to believe that this was not a cry. I would have been very happy to stay longer, but two days was all I could share. Hmm. And he's talking about, and I love that, and I, didn't, I couldn't fit the whole thing on there. But in a lot of ways, what I so appreciated about that quote was, that again, that way in which the African diaspora connected. Right. Um, and you see it with Dr. Franklin. And when he visits people asking him questions, as, as John Franklin has pointed out about the civil rights movement, about the black American experience. But then also Dr. Franklin reaching out, um, being uh, engaged in terms of, you know, uh, decolonization in Africa. Thank you. And where can we get your email so that I can email you about it? Sure. It's uh, I'll just put it in the chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate there's a, it. There's a question. Philip, I can't hear you. Yes, it's. Um, I apologize. I hope you can hear me. Now uh, I can hear you, yes. It says, I'm wondering how John Hope Franklin would react to or feel about today's political and social times in terms of Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate if he were alive today. Well, I know he would be seriously engaged in all of the issues that we're confronting today. Um, I've been working particularly around issues around the centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which his father uh, survived. And one of the most interesting questions I had from a Chinese American journalist was comparing the destruction of Black Tulsa, Greenwood, to the destruction of Chinese American communities in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, the worst being the destruction of Los Angeles Chinatown in 1871. And when I learned this from the journalist, I was saying, what a fascinating parallel of uh, disrespect and destruction of our community by hostile forces. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, reaction against people suspected of being from the Middle East following 9-11 and uh, the, the just tornado of hatred toward Asian Americans uh, in the last several years. Dad would be extremely concerned. I was reading, continuing to read his autobiography today, and there's a section where he holds a cold, he's part of a conference that Daedalus, the publication, convenes on color and race in the, United, in the world. And they're looking at issues of color and race in India, color and race in Brazil, um, and color and race in Japan, sensitivity to color. Uh, and so he would be very engaged in today's discussions on all of these issues. Thank you for that response and that question. May I just jump in? Um, I'm not sure whether you can either see or <laughs> hear me, um, but, but I, I want to thank uh, John and Nishani for those incredible presentations, um, really by our students uh, and the rest of us, gotten so much out of it. Um, with reference to the last question, um, I want to uh, point out that you know, the Reconstruction era senator from Mississippi, Blanche Bruce, uh, opposed the Oriental Exclusion Act. Um, so there is a um, history of solidarities between um, Asian Americans and uh, people of African descent. And certainly struggles for Black equality have inspired social 
justice movements um, in parts of Asia, in India, for example, um, Dalit rights movements drew uh, a great deal of inspiration from civil rights movements. And so um, I think that this is a timely moment uh, to talk about uh, Asian Black relations. And uh, I can only imagine that Dr. Franklin would have been incredibly uh, interested in that question and have a great deal to say about it. I'd also add that we should also talk about it in the reverse. Uh, during the 1930s, African-Americans visited India. Uh, people like um, Benjamin Mays, Howard Thurman, uh, interested in this whole question of satyagraha, civil disobedience and nonviolence. Um, and so what we're talking about, and this is of course embodied in Dr. Franklin, is this international exchange in which communities of color are striving to learn from each other other in an attempt to understand the ways in which they can borrow some of these ideas to a, a, attain uh, freedom for themselves wherever it is that, that, that they are. And certainly I think one of the other things that Dr. Franklin would do in terms of dealing with the politics of today is that Dr. Franklin was not shy about um, challenging white supremacy and white racism. <laughs> Look, John Franklin, and I, I'm gonna I'm be quiet because I know John Franklin got something to say about this. He is not shy. And so um, he is not gonna be someone who is going to step away from calling a thing a thing with regard to people like Trump, um, that some of the, the uh, uh, participation of some Republicans in white nationalist events, uh, that that has to be challenged. Um, and, and that there, there's a historical framework for not only understanding uh, this behavior, but ways and strategies for challenging that behavior as well. What I was going to add, uh, Nishani, is, and to Gunja as well, that Europe unwittingly <laughs> brought together people from colonial places in London. So you have people from Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean meeting each other in universities in the United Kingdom and realizing what their comparative colonial experiences has been. The same is happening in France from World War I on in that the African-Americans are fighting under the French flag and getting French medals alongside Caribbean and African men. And those who are going to university for, for graduate work. So Leopold Sangor that you saw in the picture meets Ho Chi Minh in Paris. And they plan independence for their respective nations because they're brought together by the French colonial power. So uh, the collaboration is, is unwittingly created by, <laughs> by colonialism. It's fascinating in France now, they're discussing immigration, but they won't discuss colonialism. And you can't understand the current situation without understanding where people were brought from and why. Question for Ms. Kilkenny. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. I am just enthralled with this whole gathering and conversation. I think I have a personal question for John about um, what if what he can share about his father's mission? I can relate to having a conversation with Dr. Franklin. Um, he told me he was going to devote his years remaining to make sure he leaves the data, the document, the maps, the keys to the information, treasures, et cetera, because he felt keenly that people needed to know what had been done so generations that followed would not have to unpack as much. And he was very committed to, I would consider uh, leaving the gift of his broad research scholarship experience somewhere where we could find it as a gift to those of us who would need to have that. I'm wondering if your father 
if you and your father spoke about that kind of missionary commitment to um, the unborn to be able to use what he had and knew. And I was so grateful that we had that conversation, but I don't know how much he talked to you about that in terms of his serious commitment to it. Well, my father spoke to both me and Karen about the importance of his papers and my mother's papers, not just being in an institution, but being in an institution that could make them accessible to the public. He was concerned about papers in other repositories that were not unpacked out of their boxes, that had not been processed, that had not been digitized and made accessible. So as universities and the Library of Congress vied for his papers, he felt that Duke had the ability and the will to make those documents accessible to the public, readily process them. And thanks to the generosity of David Rubenstein, my father's papers are in the Rubenstein Manuscript and Rare Book Library. And David gave close to 14 million just to that project among the over $100 million he's given to Duke. So Nashani was referring to going to the archives. Those are the archives she's referring to. And those materials are readily accessible. When Karen and I were planning my parents' centennial, we were stuck in Durham due to a snowstorm. And you know, 85 was closed. So we had three extra days in the John Hope Franklin Research Center, by which time his papers had attracted the papers, and John Gartrell can correct me, of over 60 other individuals who'd given their papers, which are also with the SNCC archives now, the African News Archives. So it's a repository of a number of items started by mom and dad's papers that has grown. And so we were stuck in Durham and we went to the archives because Karen was preparing a presentation on my mother. And there were all of my mother's notes, her class notes from library school, you know, just excellently organized as you would expect of a librarian. Now we had the fortune, Karen's mother was a librarian, my mother's was a librarian and my cousins are on this call and their mother was a librarian with Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress. So we get this history, archive, library combination, which is essential for both conserving and making this information accessible. So yes, it was part of his mission and that's part of the legacy that Karen and I have tried to fulfill. I just want to highlight the way in which Dr. Franklin's papers serve as a kind of centrifugal kind of draw in to all of these collections. They are literally bringing in collections. So it's not just that Dr. Franklin and his own papers represent this mission of, of sustaining Black history, but the placement of those papers brings in so many other collections, right? So it's created a, a serious archive of, of African-American history uh, uh, across the board. Bobby Hill brought his archives to the collection. Right. I mean, really, that's too serious. Karen. <clears throat> Excuse me, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I wanted to respond to Niani too as well. I just want you to know after John's father passed, John and I went through every piece of paper left in that house. I have never worked so hard in my life went through every single document. And we made sure that the documents that we discovered, except the things that were just particularly, some things were family that were given to the John Hill Franklin Research Center to make them accessible because we knew that was important to both of his parents. Thank you, Karen. We found letters from W.B. Du Bois 
from County Cullen, from Eleanor Roosevelt. And we added those to the collection as we came across them. Uh, it's just really remarkable. You know, there were 6,000 books, the same number that Jefferson gave to start the Library of Congress. And we gave 2,000 of those books to Duke Library. Duke, Dad had 2,000 books that Duke Library did not have. So it wasn't just his papers, it was the things that he collected over the years. I should say, actually, my background is in, as a, is in archives. I actually work for the King Library and Archives uh, for Martin Luther King uh, Center in Atlanta. And that's actually how I started working with Dr. Franklin was to, to help with organizing his papers. So he, he, for a long time, had begun the preparation process of, of mm. securing those papers. Fantastic. I think Keith Wisdom had a question. I I think I saw your hand. Yeah, I was hoping the magical hand would just come through. John, I met your father in passing. I missed my dinner with him, so I met him only in passing. So a lot of my experience of your father is obviously through you. My question to you has to do with something you said to me once, which has stuck with me uh, all this time. You said to me once, John, that when you were a child and there was a knock at the door, it could be anyone. That, that's true. That's just, that just freaks me out. So my question to you is what I think may be in the minds of many young people and, and others at this moment, what was it like to be next to this man, this phenom phenom ph phenomenon? this father, when or at any point did you go, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why are we going so many places? What, what, why are all these people coming by? I just want to sit and watch some TV. What was it like to be around this great man? And why is it so important that you, his son, carry this forward? Well, it was a remarkable household, whether we were in Washington, New York, Chicago, or traveling with him around the world. Um, I say to people that I had an unfair advantage having a historian of the 18th and 19th century and a librarian for a father and a librarian for a mother, because a librarian for a mother is the original internet. So you have access to all information anywhere. Um, my father would point out to me famous people when they would come to our house or we would meet them. I actually met Josephine Baker at a book signing. She came to one of my father's book signings and she had blue sequins on her face. I'll never forget. The phone would ring and it would be Thurgood Marshall. Is John Hope there? I said, yes, excuse me, Mr. Marshall, just a moment. My father said, this is a federal judge. Do you understand? Federal judge. Yes, sir. He was, I thought that everybody cleared the table, the kitchen table, and wrote books after dinner. So I learned emancipation, proclamation, and centennial all at the same time because dad was writing a book on the Emancipation Proclamation for its centennial. So you learn that at eight years old. So it's constant, but you learn about the world as well because people would come from around the world to places, dad had been to places and he'd been hosted in India, in Japan, in London, in Brazil, and then people would come and visit us. Uh, so I had this tremendous exposure uh, to the world. Now, kids were seeing Tarzan, but dad had his own movies of Nigeria, of the British Jack coming down and the Nigerian flag going up. When he went to Zanzibar, he called us on the phone. Now this is 1963, Kennedy's just been assassinated. And I answer the phone and my father says, hi, how are you doing with? I said, I'm fine. I said, where are you? He said, I'm on Air Force Two. 
I said, really? You're on an airplane? You're calling me from an airplane? He says, I need you to get your mother because President Johnson loaned us his plane to come back and we're bringing Jomo Kenyatta, president of, of, of Kenya, and the delegation from Tanzania and Zanzibar to present their credentials to the UN. And I need your mother to come to the airport and pick me up. So we drove to the airport and I met Dick Fox, this man that I told you earlier in our call, was pressuring my father on the flight to accept Johnson's appointment to one of the European nations as ambassador. And we go to the airport and I meet Jomo Kenyatta getting off the plane. So it's constant, it's constant. And it's a very rich environment. I have one story I have to share with you. Um, we would go to restaurants in New York. And uh, first you have to worry about being seated. Are they actually gonna give you a menu? After they give you a menu, are they actually gonna, they're gonna take your order? First you have to fight to not be seated next to the kitchen door. And then my father would see there are lobster tails on the menu. And my father would say, where are the lobster tails from? And the waiter said, I don't know where they're from. They said, well, get your manager. And if the lobster tails were from South Africa, then they would get a lecture on, they had blood on their hands, that this is from a racist South African country. And now we'll leave your restaurant in protest. <laughs> so being in that household is, is always dynamic. You're always learning things. You don't know what you're yet going to encounter. So it was a very stimulating place uh, at all times. Was there ever any sense of this is too much, this is a burden? Not at all, not at all. Uh, it was joyous, it was uh, enriching, it was dynamic. Uh, as Nishani knows, my father's travel sometimes, we talk only about the international stuff now. Dad would leave home two to three times a week. I remember when a, a graduate student moved into the house, he said, do I have to take your father to the airport? We said, oh, no, 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 he has to have a driver. You, you couldn't do anything. If you had to take my father to and from the airport, you wouldn't be able to do anything else. So uh, it was an, he was an incredible force. But uh, so was my mother. And they were quite a team to handle yeah. all of this. I think Joseph Harris, did I see a hand in your square? You need to unmute yourself. I think we can't hear you. Please, Joseph, unmute yourself. This is Professor Joseph Harris, retired historian from the University of Howard University and my father's student. Ah. Can you hear me? Yes, Joe, yes. we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, yes, there's so much I can say about, about uh, John Franklin. Uh, and if you just give me a moment or two, I'll ramble through these. I haven't planned anything. I only learned about uh, this event, I guess yesterday, last evening, I believe. Uh, but I rushed back after running a few errands a moment ago to see if I could catch up on some things. I was in the last seminar that John taught at Howard University. Uh, I think that was 1954 when he went to Brooklyn College. And we were so sad because John was a real star at Howard. And those of us who had come through the undergrad work at Howard were just so pleased to have someone like John there of our graduate studies. It was as a result of that, that a long lasting friendship developed. And I may touch on some of this and whoever is in charge, if you want me to stop, <laughs> give me a signal, I'll be glad to do so. But I, I do wanna say, uh, I finished 
Howard University in 1956 as a graduate student. And this is a time of great transition, as some of you may know. Uh, John had been asked to go to Brooklyn. That was a breakthrough opportunity for an African-American. It was also a great loss because from that point on, Black universities and colleges were drained of its stars that went, who went elsewhere. But John and I always remained in contact. And he and uh, Rayford Logan at Howard University uh, identified my interests. I took classes with both of them. Africa was just beginning to penetrate the curriculum with one exception, of course. Howard University had Leo Hansberry there from the 1920s. But Africa had not really made an impact academically. And speaking of where I might go, I spoke with John who became, I hope you don't mind my calling him John, John. Not at all. I came to know him that way. Uh, over all those years. And he said, now, boy, you know, what are you going to do next? Well, I said, I'm a poor boy. I'm going to do the best I can. He said, well, you need to continue to work. So he and Rayford Logan encouraged me to go to the African Studies Center at that time, was Northwestern University, and to work with Herskovitz and others, Herskovitz and anthropologist. And I did that. And while there, I became interested in some of the things that John had touched on during the slave trade, but had not, uh, we had not found the literature that satisfied my curiosity about the global presence of African people. And that had to do then with expanding from the Atlantic slave trade to look at the Indian Ocean slave trade, the Mediterranean slave trade. So that while at Northwestern, I began to broaden my scope of interest uh, to include in particular, the East African, the trade from East Africa to the Persian Gulf to India and beyond. And I'll always remember that. And what John said to me was, boy, if you write, he enjoyed this boy thing for some reason, but it, it was a loving kind of relationship that, that I felt. And he said, uh, if, if you develop your expertise here, you will become known, if you're known as a historian, by your first book. And I said, I don't know about a first book. I uh, had just received my degree in 65 and had been invited to the first Congress, uh, International Congress of African historians, of African historians. So the, in Tanzania, 1965, and he and an organization of blacks known as the American Society of African Culture. Some of you may know about that group that related to something I heard earlier, John, about these uh, Africans in Paris and in London, where they had organized in Paris, the Society of African Culture in an attempt to capture the essence of the African experience in preparation for what would later become an academic history of Africa. And so uh, I was invited to that conference and I always look at it because at the very back of everybody there, you see Joe Harris. I was the minor person at that conference. There were two of us from the US of called Africanists at that time from around the world. Uh, the major players there were the big 
uh, English people, uh, Roland Oliver and John Faye, some of you may know those people. Uh, but what was also important about that conference was that, that as they looked at Africa, they had difficulty relating to how the slave trade would fit into Africa. Was it Africa or was it the trade in the places where the Africans were taken? Thus, the big issue then was what became my special concern, the diaspora, the African diaspora. To what extent was there a continuation of the African experience uh, into places around the world? And that helped to define what I now do. Uh, well, I'm retired now, what I did after, uh, during my career. In my very first book, The African Presence in Asia, came out of an exploration of the slave trade uh, in the Persian Gulf and on to India and captured a part of, and I never finished this because my career, what my, the, the direction of my career as a result of that was to visit places around the world where there were communities of African descent. And that took me then uh, to um, uh, the Middle East at that time. I uh, spent some, part, some time in Lebanon, I spent some time then in Iran, and ultimately to India. And all along the way, I was in touch with John O. Franklin. And he said, boy, you're moving. I said, well, I had a mover, and that was John. I can say so much about that, but let me also say that uh, it was UNESCO that organized the Slave Route Project. And I was invited as a result of some of the things that I had done and uh, some of my professors that included John. I was invited to participate. Uh, in the several conferences that UNESCO organized as it sought to identify the presence of Africans globally. So we held our meetings in, uh, in Africa, uh, in Europe, in South America, and in the Caribbean. And two of those places, I met John. John met with us on one occasion in Barbados. John met with us on another occasion when we met in Brazil. So I had this running relationship so that I ultimately came to see John as sort of a big brother. Uh, I could reference those earlier classes that I had had at Howard University. And I emphasize that because you don't hear so much about it but how it became a very significant reference point because it was at Howard that many of the African students who came to the United States to study, that's where they went. A few mm. went to Harvard and Yale, but not very many. The great bulk of them went to HBCU. And that's where we had the advantage of John O. Franklin for a few years. I don't know, John, how much more I can say, but. I just wanted to fit in. I don't know how the program has gone to this point, but I had to get back to get my little bit, little bit in. Um, Govray Island was another place where John, you mentioned John and Tutu came out there to hold their seminar at mm -hmm. Govray Island. Well, mm -hmm. I was the vice president for the Govray Island for about 10 years mm -hmm. and was back and forth and cannot say enough about the experience a uh, very valuable and lasting experience that led to my preparation of a map of the global presence of Africans. And in, I think the last volume of John, he included that map. I believe uh, so. In, I believe so. In, yeah. hmm? I believe I so. That, that map in From Slavery yeah. to Freedom. 
So yeah, yeah. I won't dominate this, but as you can see, I can talk about John and with a bit of verve from time to time. Thank I'm you so much. Harris, yeah, we have to have you back for a full session. Um, I have been reading. I'm almost as old. As, I'm almost yeah. as old as John now, yeah. so you. So I don't get around very much anymore. But, but you've you've written a foundational text on yeah. uh, the, the, which is you know required reading in the, whenever I teach comparative slavery. So we really need to have you back to talk about uh, John Hope Franklin at Howard University. Um, Can I just jump in? Yeah. Uh, right on yeah. the side, there's this question. Uh, this is one of the sections of uh, Brooklyn Shaping the Modern World course. Um, and they wanted to know if uh, they were wondering if there were any words of advice for current students studying world history. And you literally just heard the advice that I really wanted to make sure I connected that because what Professor Harris is talking about is that historically the way scholars look at world history, it is from the framework of a Western lens, from a European lens. And what Professor Harris did is sort of break open that to talk about the ways in which other parts of the world are engaging each other. So I think in terms of thinking about the advice, right, for world history students, you wanna follow along the lines of Dr. Franklin, you wanna follow along the lines of Professor Harris and move away from this Western lens and think about the way in which the rest of the world is engaging each other. But also, if you look at what is happening now, we already see this happening. So you need to sort of look at the foundations of why we see it happening now. The formation, for example, of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Why is it that these nation states are brought together? What is it that they're doing that could be reshaping the geopolitical landscape? And it has its foundation in history. So anyway, I'm going to stop right there, but I just thought I really wanted to make sure that they were listening to Professor Harris and, and, and that the answer to their question is what Professor Harris just outlined. Well, let me also say I taught, of course, at Brooklyn College. John recommended me there. I taught for a semester wow. while, I was, while I was stationed uh, up at New Paltz. I was just beginning to teach at oh. soon the State University of New York. And yeah. I spent a very pleasant and challenging time at oh. Brooklyn College. So I have John and I crossed paths in many ways. So to be continued very clearly. And Nishani, the, those were such fantastic connections that you made. Um, my thoughts exactly. Thank you so, so much. Um, do we have any, we, we'll, just literally out of time. <laughs> so, so we may have to say goodbye. Um, thank John Franklin, Nishani Fraser, Karen Franklin, uh, Joseph Harris, uh, just, just a Keith Wisdom, all our students who asked wonderful questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. My pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you all. <laughs>